big shit, big shit. Huh. It's a unique hustle, nigga, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Huh. Name another podcast like this. Who gon- Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique host. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Mr. Maker. What's going on? Nothing, nothing. You know my dad walk on. Man, hey, man. You know, we are here in Las Vegas, y'all, once again. You know, we always, like we always do at this time. That's what Kanye say, man. Check it, man. We out here, man, and uh, we ran into a gym, man. My boy Moody is in the building. How's it doing? What's going on? Man, what's going down, brother? Shit, just out here grinding, doing this this agent work. What is you doing in Las Vegas, Nevada, man? Well, I'm currently out here working with a few talents, uh, looking to find who's the next big thing, you know, out here from Nevada. Because I ain't really heard of you know, a few artists out here. So I'm out here just working, walking the scenes, you know, walking the strip, peeping talent, you know, see who God put on next. Wow, man, hey man, you know, I, I gotta hand this over to Miss Jamaica, man, it's latest mm-hmm. first, so she gonna uh, more than likely ask you some questions that's gonna, you know, take you back to some places where you can just kind of give everybody a spiel on, you know, how you did it and how, how you came up. For sure. Okay, Moody, so, you know, our fans, all of our fans, might some might know you, some might not, mm-hmm. so for the ones who don't know you, tell us about where you from, um, were you raised in a single parent household? Mm-hmm. No, uh... <clears throat> I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I was raised where I grew up in Wisconsin, a household of nine kids. You feel me? A a full household, you know, bedroom sharing. You know, everybody was young. Nine kids? Nine siblings. Wow. Nine siblings. That's crazy. Yeah, it was was a full house. Full house. Uh, You know, little town in Wisconsin, Somerset, Wisconsin. So uh, how old were you when you moved to Wisconsin from? Because you said you were born somewhere else. Yeah, I was born yeah. in Minnesota. Minnesota. How far is Minnesota from Wisconsin? Do you know? 40 that? minutes. I'll say it's not even yeah. that far. Okay. 40 minutes, you know, from the small city that I went to high school at. Okay, so how was it growing up in um, in Wisconsin? Because I heard that's country. Yeah, Wisconsin, uh, all white school, you know, very country, you know, slight, you know, very slim black people. You know, I was like one of probably like 10, you know. Like, like, how did that feel? Yeah. That's weird. Uh, very a lot of attention on me, for obviously, because I was a colored, you know, black kid, mm-hmm. you know, all white school. So for, it was it was different, you know. Did people, you get, did you get bullied or you know did you face racism? No, nah, yeah, there was always racism, you know, in Wisconsin. People with the Confederate flags, you know, uh, you know what they call them rednecks. You know, it was people with Confederate flags. You know, I was always, you know, people hate on me in school because I stuck out. I was the person, you know doing the backflips, you know, at the football <laughs> games. I was the one stepping out, being different, you know, from the other people. Tell me one instance where you faced um, racism growing up that stood out to you. Uh, for sure, you know, at the football games, you know, from other schools and stuff, you know, I was performing at the halftime shows, you know, it'd be rivalry schools, you know, it'd be rivals, you know, I'd show out, you know, take their girls, you know, doing flips, <laughs> you know, just impressing, and you know, and you know, their school would always, you know, bring out the Confederate flag, you know, and mm-hmm. stuff like that, you know, and think it would be cool to say the N-word, you know, stuff that get ticked me off. But growing up and, you know, in that area, I knew what, you know, what was chances of me facing racism. So I never really let racism get to me. So you never wow. said nothing about it or not. So you have brothers, you said nine of y'all. How many boys, how many girls? <laughs> Uh, I got he had to think. Damn, <laughs> damn, it's a lot of them. Yeah, it's a lot because I have stepbrothers too. So oh, okay. it's like I'm. So, but like, where do you fall in between? Were you the middle child, the youngest, oldest? Where did you fall? Yeah, uh, third to the oldest. Third yeah, to the oldest. Yeah. But how did it feel growing up in a household full of so many kids? I know that in my mind, I'm like, okay, it can be fun, but sometimes it can be terrible because you're sharing everything. You you don't really have nothing for yourself. Yeah. Um, it was always, you know, everything that we did in the house, we always had to share, you know, showers, bathrooms, you know, blankets, everything, clothes, clothes everything, you know, living on a budget. Right. It was always, you know, living on a budget, you know, nobody got more than, you know, the any other. the other. But yeah, it was always living on a budget, you know, and you had to, you know, do do what you had to do, you know. You said your mom and dad lived together. Yeah, my, no, my mom. Well, uh, my mom passed when I was four years old. So wow, from my what? Pa, um, she was just very sick. Wow, just very sick. Do you remember her? Nah, I really don't. Wow. You know, uh, my older brother always told me what type of uh, woman she was, and That's you awesome. know, family and friends always told me you know what type of woman she was. I didn't really get a chance to meet my mom because you know I was very young. At the age, but I grew up with my pops. You know, my pops was uh, grew up. We grew up in Minnesota. I mean, grew up in Wisconsin. 
So uh, he had a girlfriend at the time, so she was like a stepmom. Okay, that's good. At least you had that female influence in your life. And yeah. Hopefully it was positive. Yeah. That's good. So when did you discover the music? Uh, I started, you know, I was always the kid in high school getting kicked out of class, class clown. I didn't really take high school serious because I just didn't think it was for me. When I, um, just growing up, I had a lot of ADHD energy and it always was just getting me kicked out of school. So at that point, when I got up to high school, um, I was flunking class, getting asked, but you know, in my high school, they were still moving you on, but like, it was still matter about the GPA and stuff about graduating on time. And um, that's pretty much like my high school. Like I was just flunking school, getting kicked out, suspension after school and school. So I really, I really wasn't graduating on time. So I had to come up with Figure a plan right. to like do something cause, because I was at the point where I wanted to drop out and <coughs> I eventually ended up doing it, but I ended up doing it after I figured out what I wanted to do and and how, yes, how to do it. So there's a lot of, uh, a litany of artists that you've uh, uh, engaged with uh, because of you venturing into uh, whether it be promoting or whether it be, uh, you know, just going into different business ventures. Who are some of the people that you've worked with? Uh, some of the artists that I have worked with, um, when I first started my career in Minnesota, uh, I was always on top of the concerts. When they was coming to my city, to Minneapolis, I was always on top of them. I uh, never knew the promoters, so literally when the concerts came to my city, I was usually, I had a mouthpiece, so I always was using my mouthpiece to finesse it and, you know, talk to people and tell mm -hmm. them who I was and stuff, and it always just worked out, and I always um, got myself in through the, the back door, you know, the back gate, just using my mouthpiece, because I realized how promoters and how business people were moving and how to move to get to where I wanted to be and the people that I needed to connect with. I always just had a mouthpiece to get my way in the back door. You say you always be observing. Is there any one person that you observe that you're like, man, I can pick up a lot of game from them? Yeah, there was a lot of mentors, you know, people that I looked up to. Um, when I moved to Minnesota, I had an OG, you know, Big Homie AK. Shout out Big Homie AK from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He put on for the city. He is a big OG in Minnesota. He helps put artists on, um, and it just he's just been doing it for years. And when I moved to Minnesota, I went from sleeping in a music studio to him helping me throw my own shows, put together shows, learn how to book artists, you know, get them booked. It was just a lot of things that he had taught me from sleeping on a studio couch to now I'm living in LA, Miami, wherever now. That's well, awesome. Who, who were some of the artists that you booked? Uh, some of the artists that I've done work with or helped get booked, NLE Chopper, 21 Savage, Young Thug, Chris Brown, a um, lot, Shorty Shorty, some of the new cats, Lil TJ. I've done a lot of work with a, a lot of people. Yeah, so when you think about some of those ones that you set up, which one sticks out for you to where it was complicated, but you got it done and you it was a breath of fresh, fresh air once you made it happen? Um... um there, there's a lot. Man. Yeah, but there's it's one of them that, like, you was like, damn, by the heralds of my chin and chin chin, this thing almost didn't happen. You know, sometimes it's be mm -hmm. like, like, sometime the club may be going to close early, the artist may be late, a flight may be delayed. There's a lot of things that happen when you're booking you book and show. You know, uh, actually, you know, uh, oh, there was. <laughs> <laughs> there was. Um, you know, when cities, you know, like uh, I say with Lil Durk. Okay. Lil Durk. I had Lil Durk. Uh, I had a big show I was hosting in, in our city with Lil Durk. It was Lil Durk, um, Sleazy Go. It was a lot of stuff. But, like, every time, you know, the pro police, you know, when Lil Durk, he's a big artist. And, you know, yeah, you know from, from Chicago and stuff, like, police would start tripping. It was supposed to be at the big Target, Target Center in Minnesota. Okay. And uh, the venue, I don't know. Venue wasn't it really, was you know. Trip because it's outside promoters. But did right. you get to get, yeah. did you get to make it happen? No, we ain't never so made that happen. The it. promoters never made it happen. They had me on it hosting, but yeah, we ended up having to cancel the event because you know. They got to give everybody back their money. Yeah, for with sure. The, with, with the rap that uh, these current artists bring with them, with a lot of baggage that they bring to each city because of all of the violence that goes on with the artists. Um, you would probably run into that a little bit more than often where people are very leery about inviting certain artists into the shows, right? Oh, yeah. There's, um, I ran into, you know, a few times where artists didn't fuck with each other, you know, mess with each other, my bad. 
artists didn't mess with each other and they just, you know, people had beef, people had rival gangs, you know, you know, at some of these shows, you know, areas, you know, Chicago, Atlanta, you know, it all happens, you know, people have their rivals and, you know, there's stuff like that where people will pull up after a show and just cause a scene or sometimes in, in the concert cause a scene. But how yeah. can you control all of that? Because, you know, you say with security, but even with security, you can't cover everything. Sometimes it, yeah, sometimes when you get events like that, that were shootings or fightings, like, it just, you can't control it. It just happens, you know. Sometimes it happens just in the crowd. You feel me? Like, sometimes it's to blame the venue, the venue security, you know, venue security, maybe buddies with the shooter, right. you know, stuff like that, and, you know, letting, allowing them to come in. So it's really a lot of responsibility, really on who you have securing the venue. Wow. What about this chain I see you got on? I like this chain. This piece is nice, man. Uh, this piece, the L.A. piece, it resembles, I got the L.A. piece because it resembles how I started my career in L.A. So when I first moved to L.A. is when I started started to get in buzz. I was throwing mansion parties for these celebrities. Um, I really built a base in L.A. and it meant something to me when I started tapping in with the OGs and working with how to promote, how to move. Uh, shout out Big U, the OG for unique music. Uh, learning from him, watching him on his podcast, checked in from my OGs working with him. I learned who he was and how he maneuvered, but like maneuvered around and helped grow artists, you know, like Nipsey, working with people to help grow them and market them and put them on. And I really learned a lot from just watching OGs like him. Wow. So you basically are saying that uh, these guys influenced you. How difficult t was it going to L.A. and trying to learn how to move. You said move. So you have to move a certain way in L.A. Yeah, for I just, sure. We just left L.A. a couple of days ago. We interviewed a lot of people. Um, my main concern was, okay, how do I invite this person and that person versus mm -hmm. how things are going to be organized when we get there to where it keeps everybody safe because everybody don't rock with everybody in every city you go to. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how difficult was it for you trying to understand how the boundaries were set in L.A. like that? Um, it was very hard at first. I sold everything from Minnesota when I moved to LA. I sold everything and went out there with two bands. I sold everything. I got. How a, old were you? Um, this was like I want to say like a year and a half ago, before uh, COVID. During when COVID started in LA, so beginning of COVID, so like last summer, something like that. Okay. It was beginning of COVID. I moved to LA when everything was shut down, like at a wrong time, but. So it was kind of hard and stuff. So I moved there with two bands and literally got a monthly Airbnb for 1500 and I had $500 left in my pocket and ended up tapping in, you know, with the influencers, the TikTokers and stuff like that. When I moved to L.A., I realized that everybody was a TikToker, a model. They was doing something, you feel me? And it motivated me to become and tap in with TikTokers, just people who had that type of fame or following and to see how people were doing it out there and how to maneuver and stuff like that, I was tapping in with the influencers and I ended up uh, living uh, living in a content house. It was called The Drip Crib with a bunch of other TikTokers and I ended up building my base and learning how to grow, make content, be consistent with it and stuff like that. And so you found out a lot about the TikTok world. It's yeah, serious, I, right? ended up, I was living in a content house for a little bit. It was called the Drip Crib. But it was it serious? Like those guys, they understand how to maneuver in the TikTok. Yeah, world. I moved in that house, and them guys had like five million followers. Like all them content creators had wow. millions of fans. Wow. How did that? And I was in there. I was a nobody. Wow. How did nobody. that affect you in in your movement? Did uh, it help? Yeah, for sure. It helped me being in that content house. It helped me realize how people acted when they had fans you know people who looked up to them how they moved out there you feel me because when you known in a such area like la you have to you know you have to move cautiously because people know who you are so you know when you're having that big image you soon realize who's really who's not when you first get that big image because when people get that name it just starts to see you just start to see who's right. loyal and who's not. And uh, one thing, I, um, it's a good thing you said that because I see you have that tattoo that says loyalty and death before dishonor. So mm. I know honor and loyalty is very, very big for you. Is yeah, there something that happened Why you, you know? Yeah, um, I grew up, um, one of my favorite artists died. 
His name was XX Tentacion. Mm-hmm. So I'm a, a celebrity host, and I used to do concerts, a few concerts with him and my bro Ski Mask. They were really brothers. And so when I was doing shows and concerts with him, I had that energy. Their energy inspired me to be how I be on the stage when I'm doing my MC and my hosting. Like it's off the off the top. And uh, when X passed, I had got this tattoo death before dishonor which mm-hmm. meaning like I would die before I disown my family right. and my own that I love and loyalty I'm very very big on the loyalty and the people that I bring into my life and around me how so, okay so X, X passes just just walk me through the time when you had to deal with understanding man this, my boy X is gone and he will not never come back again uh, I really listened to his music you know I was he inspired people he did a lot of things for people and so like when I seen that, you know, he was killed in L.A. at a car dealership, you know, in his own, you know, state. It just it just uh, made me want to go harder and just broke me. Like, this guy inspired me, you feel me? It's, it's It was sad, you know, but I used his energy that he provided for me and I seen. And I realized when people started making, comparing me and him and our bro ski mask, like the energy stage wise and stuff like that. It was just that I just need to keep going and his legacy and his energy, I'm gonna I'm keep it live, like, keep it on, you feel me? I'm gonna keep it live. Wow, so you know, with, with that being said, you know, after him, that was tricklings of, of artists that, that just kept getting killed, whether it was yeah. Pop Smoke, whether it was uh, Mo3, whether it was yeah. Dolph, whether it was, and the list goes on. There's a few LA artists that I can't name, but yeah. I remember them passing here within the last year. Like, how do that, that affect you when you know you're moving in some of those same circles? Uh, it affects me because um, some of them artists, you know, that have passed, you know, I've done work with them, uh, done got them bookings, so, and don't have, like, deep conversations outside of what people think with social media you know on my page you go on my page it's me pictures with a bunch of celebrities and stuff like that but behind the scenes it's really deep conversations it's really business talk with these you know artists that a lot of people like the world don't know about wow man you know you just wanted to one of the guys that uh um out here in the waves, man, these young and, and the young waves, you know, I, I respect you guys' movement so much, being that you you guys are the future, you know. So and y'all pretty much hold a key to the future. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? For me. For sure. So when I see a young star here getting to it, it's so much respect and love. Um, there's a lot of different young people that God has put in my path and I'm glad that you one of them, my brother. For sure. Moody is in the building. We out here in Las Vegas, Nevada, man, it's going down, man. We out here for magic. We've been out here now. Uh we was in LA, but we in Vegas now guys so yeah it's going down man so go ahead i got a question so out of all the whether you actually promoted this um event or not mm. what's the craziest thing you've ever seen at an event happen somebody get killed in front of me right in front of you yeah where was that at when did that happen in la and you was just promoting the gig and it see because that that brings up some shit but go ahead and tell me what happened to you you didn't see it coming for sure no, nah, I didn't see it, but I saw the argument. It was just some beef, you know. L.A., some rival, sh- rival stuff outside music festival. Not a lot of security, you know. Uh, I was hosting for a little bit, you know. I was there with a few artists, you know, a few artists that really not big, but I was, you know, bringing right. them to the festival and stuff like that. But no, nah, argument broke out, and uh, done seeing the person pull the gun out, like, uh, and shot, a- shot the dude a few times and took off. Wow. It was right you didn't run? No, yeah, I, for sure. Everybody bails. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. For sure. When a some man people, got a gun, uh-uh. everybody runs. Let me tell you, for some sure. people are in shock. Will uh-uh. to stand up uh-uh. there and be uh-uh. like, uh-uh. can't move. No. I, I, no my uh, brother was asleep one time when they started shooting, and I drug him, and then he started to run. But nobody stand. That's the big, for me, I done seen a lot of shootouts. Ain't nobody standing around in no shock. They trying to get the hell out the way. <laughs> nah, it's for sure. And, and you just, you just never know if, if the shooter, you know, is just gonna spray. You just ne- you just never know if he's just gonna shoot him. How did him. you feel about that? Because that could have been you know standing so close. You yeah, know, it was bullets, like straight was, bullets do fly. It was like three you know three people away from me. You know, it wasn't really that far. Like I I saw I saw the argument. You know, you when you see people arguing, you know, you gonna look and see what's going on. So I saw the argument and I'm like I told my brothers I was like we might have to go man shit you know stuff getting, getting stuff's getting heated right. over here. 
So we was, we start walking, you know, we still looking back. And then as soon as we see him pull the gun, we just look look away and just tell him, you know, we heard the shots. And we just got out of there as soon as we can, you know. Man. That's that's kind of the stuff, you know, that happens in so, L.A. So when you got into this business, um, the reason that you chose this business, was there anybody else in your family that was um, in this business already? Uh, yeah, my family was always, you know, some of my brothers, my older brother was always, you know, a rapper growing up, you know. I seen him do his little shows. I just couldn't go to him because at the time I was very young at the age. So I seen how my older brother was an artist and a beat producer, you know. So I seen how, you know, he was making music and stuff. He always wanted me to become a rapper too. He had a, you know, studio in his house and stuff. Always, you know, be trying to, still to this day, try to get me to get on the mic. You feel me? I've gotten the mic a few times, but like, I never you you know, took the... It. I don't know. I just never took the artist. I have too much. I think I have the, business the energy. Side. I've. I just like hosting. You feel me? I like. Um, yeah, I like the hosting because how I host. I host like I am the artist. You feel me? But I'm just not rapping a song. You yeah, know? I was it's about just not to say, my own song. What makes you different from every other host? Why do? Why should people contact you, book you, anything like that? Uh, the difference between me and other hosts. I'm just not. I'm not the type of host that's just sitting there, just talking on the mic. You know, just talking. I actually get in a crowd, interact with them crowd surf open up a circle dance circle i'm doing backflips off the speakers i'm an energetic kid you know i did gymnastics for a little bit so i'm wow. on stage flipping i'm different from a lot of hosts you know you see these concert hosts these older guys young guys you know just talking on the mic but you know i'm different when you get when you book me you get the whole package you get me bringing a fan on stage flipping over him you get the whole package in, you know. So you one of them crazy dudes that I see like on social media. You know when you watch those videos and they try to backflip over cars like a speeding car coming and they try yeah, to backflip Yeah, and that's over. how I got big in LA doing that. I was doing it in front you of You actually the, did that with a car? Yeah, I was doing that in front of the Staples Center. And that's wow. how I got recognition from camera camera people outside the Staples Center and a bunch of, you know, tours. How many tours. cars you've done that with? Is only one car you flipped over or two? Uh yeah um when i show you uh on my ig if you pull up my ig uh yeah i have a video of me flipping over a green corvette in front of the staples center wow. what's your ig Come. for them to know so they can go searching uh my ig is a fi young moody official y-u-n-g-m-o-o-d-y official how long ago together. you did that uh that was probably like uh, I still can flip now, but yeah, that's what I was like. Can you still do I it? I still like can that? flip now, but I don't think uh, I gained you know so a little bit of weight. I chilled out on the flipping, but that was like like when I moved to LA. To pretty LA. much, I was just straight flipping for companies. I was getting brands. Uh, I was flipping for uh, P Diddy's son King Combs. He has a wow. drink called Wave Juice. Shout out Wave Juice. Uh, and shout out King Combs. I still do promotion and brand and bastioning stuff for his juice, Wave Juice. And uh, yeah, I started flipping, getting drink sponsors, uh, weed sponsors, you know, all types of stuff. You feel me? I drink the drink and then run and go flip over the car, you know? <laughs> and it was good promotion. That's dope. It's really good promotion. But that takes a toll on your body, I guarantee you. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I always, like, I don't know, like, I was always Have you ever like. Failed? Like, not actually being able to do it. Like, because some people think they're invincible. They keep doing the same things over and over yeah, and for keep sure. adding on to it. And then it's scary because you can really get hurt. Yeah, for sure. I've done it. I've tried to do it. You know, a Corvette kind of a little smaller. So, yeah. with a Corvette, I was clean. I tried to do it with a Charger. I ended up, uh, like, barely clipped my head, you know, as I flipped. <laughs> Luckily, I still landed, you know, safely. But, right. like, yeah, it's still, I still clipped my head on the windshield and it, it hurt a little bit, for sure. <laughs> You know, if he was going any little faster, he would have smoked me. Wow. <laughs> Usually they go, I have them go by like, you know, five to yeah, 10 miles. I was about to say, how five fast to are they? Like five to 10 miles, probably, you know, moving. So when these videos actually, because to me, they'd be looking like they're going really fast. But if you're saying they're going five to 10 miles um, speed limit, do that. I mean, that when the video comes out, they speed it up to make it look like it's going fast. No, nah, five, 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 <laughs> ten miles per hour is fast. It's like, still fast. It's fast, <laughs> like fast. I have a video of me doing it on the Hollywood Boulevard in front of the whole strip, where I had literally stopped traffic. I had literally had my guy stop traffic to do this in front of hundreds of people on the strip. Like when they seen this. I flipped on, it went viral on the news, you know, Hollywood news was was wow. was talking about it. It was on TMZ for a little bit. It was literally just like 
teenager flips over a moving car on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> but you know, it makes it where um, it starts a trend because I've seen a lot more people do it. But you weren't the first person who'd done something like that. You have other people that you've seen before you. No, yeah, there's there's a lot of you know uh, people, street performers right. and stuff like that that I look up to that I've seen like that flip harder than me that mm -hmm. are flipping over you know multiple cars in a right, row and right. I'm like damn okay <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they working me. they working man okay, you know uh, so you you were you I, I remember I think you, you mentioned about DC you, um, just understanding no how did you guys link no me and the OG DC uh, I had met him in LA while he was working and uh, on uh, doing his strip clubs and stuff like that uh, he had I just came, literally, I just came to one of his strip clubs. The homies was talking about it, doing security there. He's like, man, I think you should tap in with this OG. You know, he, he runs clubs. He's been doing it for a minute. And, you know, he's from your state, you know, and in Houston and in Dallas. He does it in the Dallas area. I'm like, yeah, for sure. I pulled up, you know, introduced him, told him who I was, what I did. You know, I showed him, uh, I showed him, what I literally showed him was a flitty video of me flipping over a car and he said the same. He's like, holy shit, you feel me? <laughs> See my following yep. and stuff like that. He he told, you know, other people like, low, low bro, lit, you feel mm -hmm. me? And so I tapped in, I told him, I'm like, look, I'm trying to promote, you know, get mm -hmm. into the promotion, promoting stuff, you know, for the club scene and stuff like that. And he, you know, had put me on, introduced me to, you know, the people that he was working with and, I've been working with him, helping him promote his clubs and stuff like that all over. Man, so do you, I mean, being that uh, DC does a lot of different business in a lot of different cities, uh, you never know where he's going to be next. I've watched his movement, man, real fond of his movement. Um, uh, just um, just a litany of places like Atlanta, um, New Orleans. I've seen his movement For down sure. there and the L.A. movement now. Have you done anything in Vegas yet? I don't yeah, D.C. Actually, shout out to the OG D.C.s. Uh, he's opening up a new club this Friday. This Friday, August 12th. It's called Euphoric, right in Las Vegas. It's wow. a brand new club. You know, a lot of 50 beautiful women, strippers. And it's a grand opening is, is this Friday, August 12th. So, so it's, a it's a cabaret. Yeah. Okay. I'm just happy about the way that he he keep hustling. You yeah, know for sure. Saying? It's it's not as big as V Live in Dallas. It's a little you know small little classic club. You know, only like fifty dancers. But yeah, it's gonna be a nice 50 good look. Sounds a lot. Is it upstairs yeah. downstairs? Is it gonna be nude, um, topless? What is it? Uh, I haven't actually I haven't actually seen it yet. I will be seeing it this Thursday. Okay. Well, I'll actually see it this Thursday. I've seen like you know on the online the outside and a little bit of what the inside look like, but. I'll be there this Thursday to check it out. But from the looks and from the videos and stuff, promotion-wise, it's going to be good. It's going to be open all weekend. Wow. Um, you know, uh, my boy Money Moses, he always step on the scene. For sure. Uh, you and him both got that in common that y'all both rock out with DC. Yeah, for he sure. He worked at the V-Live up in Dallas. So. For sure. Man, uh, what's up, Money Moses? Man, welcome to Las Vegas, man. How many Bruh, times? We done did this what? Hold on. Hold on. Oh, we did this. You just sit here and say, you got 50 girls. V-Live ain't have a 20. V Live didn't have a twenty for yes. sure. For real, yes. Thanks for having me. The girls, unless it's a big event and they come from out of town, yeah. well, that's about it. That's, nah, a big, yeah, that's, a, was, that's a big deal. Yeah, no, nah, yeah. What I was told, like uh, they had like fifty strippers, at least dancers, you know, hired at the new club. So I'm like, okay, sure. wow. So like, you girl, bad, knowing, knowing how do you feel about bad. DC? Like when you and him work together, was it was it cool to work with DC? Because nah, he cool he'd be everywhere. He a cool person. Like he he bring the money. He bring the money? He bring the money. That nigga supposed to have been on Boss Talk a while back and he didn't show. He said he wanted to come. Well, you let that nigga know Boss town. Talk over here. We serious with He flew out of town. Him. He flew out of town. He always flew out of town. We out. Of, we flew up out of town now. We up in Vegas, man. Bro, I could this our third. What is this, our third trip up here with Boss Talk? You was with me the very the uh, first. I mean, one, two, is it four? Three. Three. One, two. Three. 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 Three, yeah. Man, so we yeah, we up here for the third time in Las Vegas shooting, man. And we had, we didn't sit down with Moody today, man. This guy right here, um, you want one of those guys. So what do you think about the promote, promoters and the promotions that was going on with V-Live uh, Money Moses down in Dallas? We probably needed him. <laughs> and some, and I'm, I'm not going to say it was, the, it was the club. I'm saying it was the scene because all that stuff was happening. So it's like everything was happening. So it's like you couldn't really just do nothing because too much killing happening. And most of the shooting was really after... The club after they live really so it's like it's always around the club it's like then in ecstasy the club next to it it's like they do a lot of shooting over there but they always blame on v live wow so it's a so do you think cause v live didn't v live close now in dallas it's closed now they turned it to uh the forest it's like a restaurant slash so, 
So right basically now the shooting supposed to have slowed down, but another young lady got killed at at ST or something. That was the security guards. Wow. That's something they had something to do with that. Wow. So how much I know you talked about killing a little bit, mm -hmm. like dying at these shows or whatever, man. How how tough is it far as the security per measures that you guys take when these shows are going on? Uh experience is is big, you know. When I'm uh, I'm never the person to book the security, but you know, Sometimes people recommend, I know a lot of, you know, professional security companies, so the investors always would ask me, like, you know, what's a good security team and stuff like that. You know, I'd give them a few recommendations of people that I have worked with, some companies that I personally have worked with, and people who have done personal security for me and stuff at my events and stuff like that. So I would just give the investors or the promoters this recommendation. Most of the time, they already had, you know, their people uh, book for the security. Well, Travis Scott, though, he was one that had a show that went crazy for a while back in the day, back in a while back. Uh, he's I seen him kind of resurfacing again and trying to move past what had happened. For sure. Um, and, and have Hold you ever on. worked with him? Uh, yeah, I've done uh, met Travis Scott a few times. I was supposed to be at Astro World literally the, when the when the, uh, when the sad happened? news had happened and stuff like that but I had some other bookings to do I was supposed to be with a few other artists that were going to be on the lineup but I ended up uh, having to do some other things that day and uh, I really uh, was sad I couldn't go because Houston that's where I went to high school and stuff with for a little bit so I really fuck with Houston how what high school he did you uh, I went to Atascacy to high school okay. a very very huge school what you about to say money I, I think when they book securities they need to book securities from another city not the city uh, that you're in, because that city that you're in, they know, like he, like he said earlier, they, they know the people's already, that's around them, so they know the people, so they're like, they gonna let someone with guns, you're gonna pay to, pay to bring guns in, so that should be security from out of town, that way they don't know nobody. I agree. What do you think about, okay, so you said something earlier about, uh, off, off the camera, about a documentary. What, give, give me a spiel on how you plan to uh, do a documentary, and how you, how's it coming? So right now, I'm documenting my lifestyle of how I be coming, I'm, Right now, um, I'm documenting my lifestyle of how I'm working as an MC, as becoming uh, from becoming nothing to now becoming something as a big MC, a hype man. Pretty much, that's how I carry myself is a hype man because most of these people, you know, my supporters, family, they know me as a hype man who turns up, you know, concerts, club events, stuff like that with all these celebrities. So I turn up the crowd before they come out. Wow, dope. Man, so, um, man, top three artists of all time, dead or alive. Top three artists of all time, dead or alive. Number one. Uh, my favorite, uh, I got to put X on there. XX. Okay, X. X, X. Um, Number two. Juice World. Juice I, World. I've, I worked with Juice World for a minute. Them, them guys really inspired me, so I got to put them on there because they inspired my lifestyle and my energy. And the third one, I got to say, uh, uh, Polo G. Polo G. Polo G. Man, I see where you at with yours, mm -hmm. man. Yeah, Polo G. Yeah, you can tell yeah, his style. Yeah. Man, Great so different. how can people get a hold of you if they're trying to link up with you, man? Uh, usually my IG or my email. I have a business email people can use, but most of the time I'm very active on my Instagram, and I'm always getting back to DMs right away. Like, it's quick to catch me on the Instagram. Instagram man, uh, if it's family or friends, they, uh, you get my Facebook. Okay, and that, and what is your Instagram again? My Instagram is Young Moody Official. Y U N G M O O D Y O F F I C A L Official. Man, you know what, man? Hey, man, we love you, brother. We appreciate you for coming on. For I, sure. We link for life now, man. You Boss Talk One Hundred and One certified. For sure. And uh, just before we cut the uh, the podcast, I just want to say I'm a prime example from coming from nothing to something. And I became what I became because of who I am, and I stayed true to who I was. And I just want to say, man, you can do anything. God gonna bless you if you work hard for that shit. Man, that's real talk, man. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on the show again, Money Moses. We out here in Las Vegas, man. How you liking it out here? Bro, it's really fun, but it's just that the heat. I hate the heat, bro. <laughs> you can't go nowhere without sweating. Man. I like that. So, so, you know, we've been tackling this for a minute now, man, and Boss Talk 101 been around for, like I said, it's the third time we've been up. We came on early in the game. Vegas was one of the first Did we come before the pandemic, right? We came before the, pandemic. the pandemic. We came one time before the pandemic, then we shut down for a year. That's yeah. why we consider ourselves to have been around for a year now, because the pandemic kind of shut everything off. And then we went full-fledged, I believe, in 2021. Yeah. And we're here right now, man. So, for Boss sure. Talk 101, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. For sure. Uh, make sure you guys like
like and subscribe to our channel. Um, all the people, if you if you're looking to sponsor us, you know we put up our own money because we bosses right now. We've been bosses. That's why it's Boss Talk 101. We've been doing the Vegas thing, the <laughs> Cali thing, the Houston thing, For the sure. Atlanta thing, the Chicago thing. Let's go, Arkansas. man. Arkansas, Little Rock. Shout out to Gutter TV, man. Hey, Louisiana, man. <laughs> hey, down there. We everywhere, man. Everywhere. Like my boy said, he say the earth is the what? The earth is our turf. Hey, man. Check it, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. What a boss is talk. talk.